We've sentenced the Pixar villains of the 90s and most of the 2000s, so now it's time to finish those 2000s off. The late 2000s was quite an interesting time for Pixar. Following their purchase by Disney, the company created some of the most acclaimed films in their entire filmography, including Wall-E and Up. That said, original ideas weren't all Pixar had in stores for audiences. As we approached the 2010s, they went back to the world of Toy Story for a third film, which would set a trend for Pixar in the new decade as they revisited many older titles with sequels and even prequels. But of these three films, Wally, -E, Up, and Toy Story 3, which had villains that deserved a light sentence for their crimes, and which had villains who needed to pay for their crimes with blood. I'm Kyle with Wicked Binge, and this this is Sentencing Pixar Villains for Their Crimes, Part 3. Let's start things off with a quick trip to the stars. Without any further introduction needed, it's time for the villains of Wally -E to take the stand. First up, we have the wheel of the axiom, Otto. Otto has one main directive, to ensure that the entire surviving human race does not return to Earth under any circumstance. It follows this order to the letter, even when a plant appears that shows life is sustainable on Earth after all. Upon learning of this, Otto commits a mutiny and becomes determined to dispose of this plant. Sir, I insist you give me the plan. Not only does he commit theft as he tries to take the plant from Wally, but he even becomes guilty of attempted murder and is quest to get rid of the pesky robot. Beyond that, Otto's usurping of the ship captain adds more charges to his sentence beyond just mutiny. It's also an example of him abusing his power, and the fact that his actions effectively put all of humanity at risk would also qualify as public endangerment in our eyes. With all that in mind, we have to give Otto the death sentence, starting this video off on a pretty sour note. As we stated, Otto's actions could have had dire consequences on the future of both Earth and mankind. And with that kind of effect, how could we not give him a harsh sentence? Hopefully he enjoyed those 700 years of service, because it's time for good ol' Otto to be sent over to the trash compactor. Next on the stand we have Shelby Forthright. While not a villain in the usual sense, Forthright's actions have a lasting impact on the universe of Wally. -E. The CEO of the by and large company, Shelby wanted to make Earth a more comfortable place to live for all, but in the process caused so much trash to pile up that humanity had no choice but to leave their now uninhabitable home. When it comes to criminal charges forthright would be handed, negligence is the first one to come to mind. He allowed trash to keep building up more and more until it became too much to handle. Had he been paying better attention, he could have fought the pollution battle a whole lot earlier, and maybe prevented things from getting out of hand in the way that he did. Operation cleanup has well, uh, fail. Littering also feels like a natural charge that should be counted towards his sentence. He is directly responsible for all the trash that has built up and consumed the planet. Could we call that anything else but littering? How about mass pollution? In conclusion, Forthright's actions have had dire consequences on humanity for hundreds of years, and as such, we sentence him to 70 years in prison. We originally considered giving Shelby a much more lenient sentence, but once you start to realize that everything in the movie was more or less because of him, it becomes hard to give him the benefit of the doubt. At the very least, he should be happy he doesn't have to endure 700 years of solitude like the survivors of the human race did. Finishing up the fiends of Wally -E brings us to what some would consider to be an odd choice, Captain McCree. The captain of the Axiom, McCree, definitely gets his heroic moments, but they only come after a lot of negligence on his part. He, like a lot of the other captains before him has grown complacent by the time the film begins. That complacency and negligence are what truly allowed Otto to thrive as the real captain of the ship, which nearly doomed the surviving human race as a result. His sense of complacency is also why he didn't know anything about Earth. He had no reason to learn about a planet it seemed like was truly gone forever. Still, while we've pointed the finger at him for a while, he still plays an invaluable role in the Axiom's return to Earth. He learns to do things 
on his own without the need for a machine, defeated Otto, and pilots the Axiom back home. With all of these things in mind, we've decided to give him a pardon. We went with this because while he did indeed display negligence, the same is true for all the preceding ship captains. His showcase of bravery and heroism, however, is unique to him. While he's far from perfect, we don't think the Axiom could have asked for a better captain during its voyage back to Earth. Now we move away from the stars and back down to the clouds for the next film, Up. First is the legendary adventure gone bad, Charles F. Muntz. An explorer who was once idolized by a young Carl Fredrickson, Charles is a lot older when the two finally meet, as well as a lot more evil. He's obsessed with finding a mysterious snipe, and he will kill anyone who tries to stand in the way of him in his pursuit of fame. And he has done just that to several explorers before he met Carl, meaning he's the only character we'll be covering today that has committed murder. During his attempts to dispatch Carl and Russell, he becomes not only guilty of attempted murder, but also of endangering a child. Lastly, Muntz engages in several actions throughout the movie that would absolutely count as animal cruelty. Both his use of canines as enforcers and his relentless pursuit of Kevin come immediately to mind. Just wait till they get a look at you. A villain who is cruel to anybody he encounters, Charles Muntz is yet another villain who gets the unfortunate distinction of receiving the death penalty with his manner of execution being firing squad. As the only villain in this crop of films to successfully carry out a murder, even if only implied, it would be hard to argue that Muntz deserves anything less for his crimes. Charles Muntz isn't alone in his mission, however. He also utilizes a trio of guard dogs, which soon prove to be just as dangerous as he is. The leader of this pack is also the next character we'll be covering, Alpha. Alpha is saddled with a not-too-intimidating chipmunk voice, but don't let that fool you. Not just continue sitting, but Alpha is quite the competent henchman, and he has the crimes to prove it. Not only is he guilty of aiding Muntz in his various schemes, but he also helps kidnap Russell, adding both kidnapping and child endangerment to his list of crimes. Ultimately, we believe it's best if this pup gets five years in the doghouse. While Alpha is a scary foe, he is only a henchman at the end of the day. Besides that, he does start to turn a new leaf after the events of the film, as seen in the short Doug's Special Mission. Really, what Alpha needs is some time behind bars and maybe a major attitude adjustment, and definitely a better voice box. With Alpha covered, we now welcome his companions Beta and Gamma. A Rottweiler and Bulldog, respectively. Beta and Gamma aren't quite as evil as Alpha is, but they still do commit some rather despicable crimes. In particular, both are guilty of aiding and abetting Muntz and Alpha in their adventures. However, the two are rather lacking in terms of criminal charges unique to them. As such, these two canines will be receiving three dog years behind bars. Like Alpha, they get out of a harsher sentence because they're reformed. Also helping them is the simple fact that they just don't commit a lot of crimes independently of either Muntz or Alpha. Beyond the film's big climax, we don't really see them as anything other than lackeys to Alpha, who is already a henchman himself. As we enter a new decade of Pixar with the 2010s, it's time to revisit some old friends. It's time to discuss the terrible toys of Toy Story 3. The first villain we'll be looking at is none other than Lotso himself. Lotso is a tyrant in every sense of the word. He lords over Sunnyside Daycare, and will make sure that anyone who dissents will ultimately fall in line. Just look at what happened to Buzz. He was essentially tortured by Lotso and his gang, his first criminal offense, but certainly not the last. Remove screws to access battery compartment. Throughout the film, Lotso assaults Woody and several of the other toys as they try to escape from the daycare. Most despicable of all, however, is he tries to murder all of Andy's toys when he leaves them in the incinerator. As a whole, Lotso is a great example of an individual abusing their power. Rather than being a kind and generous leader to the Sunnyside daycare, he rules through fear and terror. He operates a dangerous class system where those most loyal to him are benefited, and the rest of the toys are left to fend for themselves. As a result, we give this Huggin' Bear a life sentence. Lotso's daycare is essentially a prison for all toys that don't fit into Lotso's inner circle, so it's only appropriate that he gets a punishment equal to that. At the very least, we do think it's preferable to being attached to the front of a garbage truck. 
Next is the brawn to Lotso's brains, Big Baby. Big Baby started life as another toy owned by the same girl who had Lotso, until the two were lost during a trip. After that, Lotso became bitter towards kids, and the same held true for Big Baby. In regards to criminal offenses, Big Baby is most notably guilty of aiding and abetting Lotso in every step of his evil plans, from kidnapping Buzz to pursuing Andy's toys as they attempt to escape. He'll help Lotso through anything, or or will he? During the final act of the film, Big Baby realizes Lotso for the tyrant he is, and disposes of him, helping the toys escape in the process. With his redemption accounted for, we think it makes the most sense for this immense infant to serve a full year in the Slammer. Though he's done some terrible things, he only did them to help Lotso, and he soon learned from his mistake and became a better toy. That change in allegiance, coupled with his henchman role, is what helped this baby escape a far longer timeout session. Last up for the day is another one of Lotso's lieutenants, Ken. Ken may be more talkative and pragmatic than someone like Big Baby, but his brand of evil is all the same. Just like him, he aids Lotso in his plans before reforming and helping Andy's toys. Ken even becomes the new head of Sunnyside alongside Barbie, as they work together to make the place better for toys from all walks of life. Since his character trajectory and crimes are pretty much the same as Big Baby's, it only makes sense to give him the same sentence of a year behind bars. We're not sure what he'll like less, how a prison uniform looks on him, or having to wear that and nothing else for a whole year. But let us know in the comment section if you agree with our sentencing, and tell us what we should cover next. Remember to hit that notification bell and binge more of our videos. But most importantly, stay wicked.